Thanks for having me today. Yes, I know it's a little unusual to have a horticulture department member present for the research department, but I'm really excited to be giving this presentation and hoping to build some connections between the two departments. So today I'm going to begin with the definition of a botanical garden. Um, according to BGCI, that's Botanical Garden Conservation International, botanical gardens are institutes um, holding document and collections of living plants for the purposes of scientific research, display, education, and conservation. So in this definition here, I, un I stress and underline documented because much of the research in that I present today wouldn't be possible if the collection wasn't documented. And we'll talk about that a lot. So as I see it, horticulture, uh, research, and education are core building blocks of that definition. And the horticulture department grows and displays plants um, for the purposes of research and education. Research researches plants so that horticulturists have some stories to tell in their education, and so on and so forth. And I really see conservation as that center point between the two. Of course, this is a pretty simplistic diagram, and all of a sudden it gets more complicated when you start really thinking about it in detail. Does not the horticulture department do some of its own research? Think about a propagationist that or uh, trying to propagate a plant that's never been grown in cultivation before. Aren't they learning from very practical experiments and then documenting their findings? So today I'm really going to talk about the crossroads between the two and some shared work between these two ideas of horticulture and research. And particularly, I want to talk about ex situ conservation work. So today, this is a kind of outline for the presentation. I'm going to focus on the horticulture piece of the equation mostly. That's why it's big here, not because it's more important. Um, so first, I'll start off with this um, idea of a horticulture collection as a living library. And then I'll talk about how we're expanding the collection of ex situ material here at the garden. Then I'll highlight two research projects shared between the horticulture and research departments aimed at developing valuable ex situ collections. And finally, I'll talk about some future directions and opportunities. So the garden at Missouri Botanical Garden, the garden, is a taxonomically diverse um, collection conceived as a living library. So at first glance, this seems like a very simple, non-controversial statement. But it's actually um, something that the horticulture department's really grappling with. And I think really the botanical garden community in general is really grappling with what we mean by this statement, because I think it's the basis of many botanical gardens founding philosophies. So I'm going to break down the sentence a little bit. So a taxon, we're a lot of taxonomists here, is um, a group of any rank, such as a species, family, or class. However, when we make this type of statement, what, what level in the tree of life are we referring to? What, what taxonomic level are we focusing on? What are we trying to highlight? And can this statement refer to um, genetic diversity within the lowest level in this fam this tree of life with interspecific genetic diversity? I don't know if that's kind of something we're grappling with. And then the second part of the sentence that I think should be highlighted is the purposes of a library. And I think the key component of a library comparison is that libraries are accessible for use and not just for display purposes. So really, how are we trying to make the horticulture collection useful for people? What are its uses? And I think we have some very different answers to that question within the garden here. Different areas have very different focuses. This is the Iris Garden, the Chinese Garden, and the Kemper Center for Home Garden Gardening. Each really has a different purpose. So you have the Iris Garden, which is focused on displaying a diversity of cultivars of irises. So in this garden, visitors can really take a deep dive into differences in shape and color within the same floral morphology, within the same species. 
But other areas of the garden have a really different taxonomic focus. For example, the Chinese garden is, displays plants from China, pretty obvious. But there's a bunch of different genera and species potentially displayed. While the Kemper Center for Home Gardening, pictured here, has an even different purpose. It's really to showcase the diversity of plants used for use, especially used by the home gardener. And in this particular bed, we have a display of different winter greens that you can grow right here in Missouri. So that's a diversity of greens, of well, mostly brassicaceae, but diversity. So garden-wide, how are we? What are some garden-wide metrics for diversity? of taxonomic diversity? Well, there are approximately 54,000 different plants that are tracked, individual plantings that are tracked here at the garden. And they represent about 17,000 species in Indo-Pacific taxa. So it's another metric of the same, same measure of uh, the garden's success. So going back to the library comparison, just like a library, we have a catalog. In our case, it's the Living Collections Management System. It's open to the public. You really can search it on the web right there, www.livingcollections.org. Um, um, and, and in it, you really can find data about all the plants in the garden and their history and how they were cultivated. So some of the data in our database behind the scenes is hidden for purposes um, to protect the plants, basically. So some of it's masked. However, the horticulture department would be more than happy to make that available to you upon request. Um, additional information behind the scenes includes propagation information, weed risk, weed risk assessments, and action items which track the plants throughout their lifespan. And if you have a project, we really are happy to make this type of data available to you. So material at the garden can be checked out by researchers. We do keep records of all the material from the living collection that is used for various projects. So if you're interested in using living material, please let us know. We have an online form you fill out and we just where we can document what's going on. Um, so here in this picture is an example of an orchid where um, one of our staff took a leaf sample for, for DNA processing by a postdoc in Harvard la at Harvard last year and sent it off in the mail for a phylogenetic analysis. So next I will talk about the developing collection of ex situ material. So let me set this scene a little bit with some definitions. So in situ species conservation is conservation of species inside their natural habitats, while ex situ species conservation is conservation of species outside their natural habitats. But very important to note here is that ex situ species conservation should only be used to support in situ species conservation. However, when you start thinking about these definitions, they're problematic because we all know that natural is really hard to define humans influence environment across the globe in various ways. So therefore, you can alternately think of in situ and ex situ species conservation as a sliding management scale where ex situ species conservation is the more extreme end of management, of the management intensity. So clearly at the garden, we're practicing very extreme species management and thus ex situ conservation. That's, that statement is not controversial. And as I stressed earlier, I will stress it again, ex situ species conservation should only be used to support in situ species conservation. And four ways Ex situ efforts may support in situ efforts include addressing the causes of primary threats, 
addressing the consequences of primary threats in restoration and as insurance policies, or insurance populations, similar to insurance policies in a way. So in some cases, the horticulture department sees the material we hold as these insurance policies, um, populations. So in this example, we have Chromia gigas. It's a critically endangered tree species from, species from Kenya with about 20 known individuals in the wild. And we hold an equal number here in the horticulture department in, in one of our greenhouses. So holding material ex situ the garden can also address some of those other benefits of in situ conserv uh, sorry of ex situ conservation. So it, they can provide, in, for example, they can provide ways to address the causes of primary threats, and these include through their research potential and educational potential. So back to that example of Chromia gigas, I think it was pretty well publicized that the 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 collection of the garden bloomed and this was really the first time scientists had ever been able to document the floral morphology of the species so really providing us information to inform in situ conservation efforts so how are the ways the department does the department maintain its ex situ material well, it's predominantly either through seed banks or whole growing plants. And there's some advantages and disadvantages of each. So seed banks um, are advantageous as they are efficient long-term storage, while whole growing plants provide knowledge about, can provide knowledge, opportunity to gain knowledge about propagation and cultivation, along with educational opportunities. This picture is of Cylindrocyne commersonii, and it is being grown in the garden. It's on display in the Climatron in a conservation-focused bed about Mauritius, because it is a critically endangered species from Mauritius. But it's also being held in the seed bank, and this is an image of its seeds. However, not all material is appropriate for seed banks. So exceptional species are species that cannot be effectively and efficiently stored long-term in conventional seed banks. And there's a few reasons that species can be deemed exceptional. And that includes insufficient available viable seed, seeds that are intolerant to desiccation, seeds that are partially desiccation tolerant but have a short lifespan, and seeds with very long germination times or those which have not been successfully germinated by um, common methods. Um, and here is an example of Quercus arkansana. It's a vulnerable tree species from the southeastern United States. And it is an exceptional species because the seeds, the acorns, and you can see them right here, are not tolerant to desiccation, the drying conditions that are needed for long-term storage in seed banks. So we're really look at horticulture looking for ways to expand our ex situ collection. So let's go back to this Chinese garden example for a moment. And now imagine if, say, I don't know, this tree in the center here was a wild of wild origin um, and perhaps even rare imagine the value that could potentially add to the collection so how are we planning to make this happen so how do we plan to acquire and maintain this material I think the one of the first things we're doing is creating target list of species that would be good for this sort of ex situ work. So I created this targeting database where we take this, a species list and combine them with some known characteristics, such um, 
known characteristics of interest, such as what other gardens does this plant occur in? Does it occur in any other gardens? And what is its conservation status? And then we are doing things like um, acquiring material through collecting trips. This is Ryan who works over in the um, maize area, collecting seeds of, who is there? Why can I not think of this right now? <laughs> um, I can picture it, Keller Hoey Bushy Eye. Um, we're also developing um, the hardy plant nursery to propagate um, ex situ material. And how many people here have been, been out there? It's quite a new faci facility. It's quite a few of you have. So before I go any further, I'll kind of summarize where we're at now. So currently there are roughly 1,500-ish um, species or interspecific taxa that are deemed rare or threatened it, within the garden. Not all of these are of wild origin. But there are also roughly 8,000 accessions that are wild sourced. And when I say wild sourced here, I mean first generation removed from the wild. Yeah? That is correct. That is both seed bank and grown out. Um, and it might, this particular number may or may not include Shaw. It depends on how you divide the pie up and what, how you're dividing our different holdings and whether you include, yeah. But yes, it, it, this is a broader number. Um, so next I'll present on two research projects um, shared between the departments. So this is the more research heavy side of the talk, less vision of where the garden's going. Um, and we'll talk about two research projects shared between the departments. And first, d addressing the value, how to build ex valuable ex situ collections. The first topic I'll discuss is kind of asking this very broad question, can we grow it? But before I should go any further, I should thank all my collaborators and mention all my collaborators on this project, on these projects. Those include Andrew Wyatt, Vice President of Horticulture, Becky Sucker in the back there, who is um, the Living Collections Manager, Jared Chauncey, who is a senior horticulturist, and he's in charge of the Linnaean House, the Tempered House that's closed now under renovation, and the new conservatory. And then Alana Sanders, who is the acquisitions manager, collections acquisition manager. And finally, Yvonne Jimenez, who is a researcher here at CCSD. So for this first project, we asked, can we successfully grow it outdoors at the garden? The challenge was to create an easy to interpret metric that predicts the success of plants grown ex situ. Many plants are consider, we're considering for our ex situ work have never been grown in cultivation. And we want to predict, before we bring them here, can we even grow them? So the success of cultivated plants is assessed through hardiness zones. So regions across the USA and the globe are assigned different region numbers based on their average annual minimum temperature. And then growers across the U.S. grow the plants, and then they say, all right, this grew great. It's suitable for this climate. And then they sell it. And then there's a list available of what, what is predicted to be able to grow. I mean, it, what list of what can grow based on people's experience growing it. There's really no formal metric for these assessments. It's in some ways a benefit of commerce that we even have these. Clearly, that approach doesn't work for predicting success of ex situ material. So we considered a few approaches to predicting the success of wild collected plants. And those include a climate envelope analysis, a climate distribution model, and a survival model. 
And each of these, I will describe how we are approaching them with the example of Asclepius Ingelmanni. Practice this so much. Asclepius Ingelmanni. Ani, uh, <laughs> I apologize. Um, but it's obviously a milkweed that grows in the uh, southwestern United States and in Mexico. And, and what I will discuss really in each of these, with each of these um, metrics, is a little think about what do we mean by success? How are we? What, when I say success, that's really an open-ended term. And I think that is that is what we're really going to look at with, when we explore each of these metrics. So using a climate envelope approach, we ask, does the climate at the garden fall within the range of climates experienced where a particular species has been documented to occur? And if it does, we can say it's most likely successful at the garden. So at, in this graph, you can see um, t uh, climate envelope analysis with two variables. On the x-axis down here is minimum temperature the coldest month. And on the y-axis is um, precipitation of the driest month. And then each one of these orange dots represents one of these orange dots, so the, the climate at one of those known occurrences. And then you can see the range the, of the variables, uh, climatic space, with um, that the species experiences and those known occurrences in the gray box. And then you can see us at the garden. And you can see, and you can see that the um, the temperature variable falls within the, the town garden falls within the range of the temperature variable but not the precipitation variable. And this has really left us questioning, what does this mean? And that's kind of why I have the same statistics, same thing, the same graph represented here, but with numbers, plus a bunch of additional variables. And we had this analysis done. It looked nice. But just like you can't probably read that from the back, a horticulturist were asked, left in, what does this mean? What is the relative importance of each of these particular variables? All right, so it doesn't fall in one variable. Can I still grow it? Is it successful? So the second approach to think about, so to think about relative importance of variables, would be a species distribution modeling approach, where you can, um, and this is a simple Maxent um, species distribution model for the same species. And you can see here the dark red areas are of low suitability, and the high, the blue areas are of high climate suitability and climatic space. However, this is only somewhat helpful as that we really don't know how more or less suitable this climatic space is. It's, it's a metric without a meaning in some ways. Um, and it's also really geared towards the predicting occurrences of species, not success in cultivation, which we know is a very different environment. So that's where Yvonne came into the picture, and we started doing some work. So we really weren't satisfied, so we looked at instead looked at survival models. So with Yvonne's help, together we were able to develop a tool utilizing LCMS inventory data. That's the knowledge the horticulturists have gathered with, uh, with their success and failure of plants in the garden, of growing plants in the garden, to predict survival. So in contrast with other approaches, success is clearly is defined. It's directly measured in number of days alive. In this case, all this work is going to feature days alive of plants outside so that we're getting those climatic variables. And here you have the same species, and say we could predict over time the, ch um, the chance of survival over time. So for this study, we focused on modeling plants grown outdoors at the Botanical Garden, representing 410 species sourced from 530 localities. Um, and you can see these species represented on the map here. 
So every orange dot is a collection location. And then uh, we're here. Um, and it's really important to note that the study specimens the, in this study really only accounted for a very small number of the plants grown at the garden. And that's because we were limited to data where we had coordinates of collection location. So despite the fact that we have all these plants growing here and all those wild accession plants, we are missing provenance information. And it really stresses the importance of maintaining that sort of data. So again, for this study, we we're interested in the number of days a plant survived outside. So on this little graphic, you have time on the bottom, and then for a series of plants on the kind of x-axis. And the black dot is the time the plant was planted outdoors. And the circle here is for time of death. And the difference between the two, that's survival time outdoors. That's our variable of interest. Um, but you can see for plants, I believe it's one and four, they're still, they don't die because they're still alive today. This is an ongoing and growing data set. Um, set. And I think it's also, before I move any further, really important to point out that all the plants in this study were grown on the grounds in display, in display landscapes. They were not grown specifically for this study. So we took, um, using that data, we created um, about 300 different models. Now, obviously, I'm going to break it down for you and not present all 300. I'm going to break it down to two broad categories, locality models and species models. In the locality models, model survival, survival probability outdoors of the botanical garden as a function of the climate of the propules collection locality. And this is really meant to simulate or local adaptation. The species models, on the other hand, modeled survival probability outdoors at the botanical garden as a function of the climate across the distribution of the species. So these models are regarding survivability as a functional trait of the species. So with both these categories of models, we created climatic difference variables that were informed by horticultural care. Um, so for the um, locality models, we use the difference between the climate at the botanical garden and the climate where the collection was made. That's the collection of the material growing in the garden. And then for the species models, we used a difference between the whole range of the species and the botanical garden. However, because we know we take care of these plants with horticulture, we modified these difference variables. They're not straight differences. Um, for example, we have irrigation of the garden. So we were really not interested if it rained more at a particular location than at the garden, because we figure we can make up for that rain through watering. But if it's in a desert environment, it's a lot harder for us to get rid of water. So that was a difference we were interested in. So what did we find? Well, we found that low-quality models were the winner. They had the highest level of empirical support. So that suggests there is some local adaptation when it comes to survival and responses to climate. So a key finding was that locality models allowed for interspecific variation, and there was thus, hopefully, we think, interspecific variation in survival. And then we were able to predict species-specific survival by collection location. So this map is um, a, shows survival as in these with different colors, but it's interpreted over here on this scale. So on the x-axis of our, our maps legend is time and days, and the y, survival probability. And if you follow any one of these lines, you can see how survival probability changes over the time. And then you can match the color on these lines back up to a color on the map and see a prediction of survival at the garden at any one of these localities. So we have at the collection location, this is for this particular 
Asclepias at, this was where it was collected in the plant that's growing in the garden. And you can see, I don't know, it's probably, obviously you can do math and, with the maps and find the numbers, but I'd say it's around a blue-green. So at five years, about 75% probability of survival. That's, you know, that's pretty good for us. We also found that mean survival was higher for woody species than non-woody species. Um, so you can see here, this is the results of the mean survival of woody species in the study. Um, so the dark blue areas are where survival was the highest reflected up here. And then I should note that all the gray on the map was climate that was outside of the range of variables for the species in the study. You know, we never tried to grow a plant that had a climate within, you know, sub-Saharan Africa range outside of the garden. So here is the same um, spatial patterns are reflected for non-woody species, but they're really depressed. So we're then able to apply these predictions for species within our targeting database and come up with estimations of whether we thought they might be pot good potential targets for the garden. So one more project I'm going to describe is kind of addresses the question of, so now we know what we can grow, how many should we grow? So we realized our survival analysis could be used to address another challenge faced by the garden, particularly by the horticulture department. And the challenge is to identify the number of plants we should initially grow to reliably meet an ex situ conservation goal while accounting for plant death attrition. Our we realized attrition, so plant death, especially over time, is survival. So we're measuring the same things. So while there are many different conservation goals I could address with this type of work, in this particular instance, I'm going to speak to the goal of creating an insurance population for exceptional species of conservation concern, such as Quercan Arkansana, pictured underneath us in the slide. There's a, a bunch of work being done on identifying individuals or gui creating guidelines to identify which individuals or, or how many individuals you should grow to capture neutral genetic variation within an insurance population or within an ex situ population to ensure the survival of the species. And available guidelines are typically within 200, 60 to 200 individuals collected across the geographic range of the species and we really wanted to know if you're going to have this insurance policy for population, excuse me, for, for more than the moment you start it, how many individuals should you grow? So even without considering attrition, you can already might be thinking to yourself, is it a little ridiculous for us at the garden to grow 60 to 200 Quercus arkansana? It's a mid-sized tree. All of a sudden, we'd have a garden full of Quercus arkansana. And we've just, I just started this talk off about the quandaries about whether, what is a taxonomically diverse collection, and this wouldn't make everyone happy. So however, there's another idea out there that imagine that the plants could be shared across multiple institutions. So a meta collection is a network of spatially separated living collections that is large enough to represent and maintain interspecific variation. So this concept is really modeled that after that of the success of zoos, which routinely breed, shared, trade, and track an animals between institutions. So now all of a sudden you can split your population of Quercus arkansana up into between multiple institutions and potentially hold a much larger insurance po population. However, the current literature does not adequately address how to plan for attrition in the context of a meta-collection. Um, 
And as you know from our previous study, we saw that survival rates are provenance, so the collection location dependent, and also most likely living collection dependent, that's collection at the, the site of the garden. And the current literature really doesn't know how to address either one of these statements um, when it comes to attrition and planning for attrition. And the fact that current literature treats attrition in a very simplistic manner as a deterministic process. It uses math you learn in middle school. So that is the number of plants at time t, so that's your, um, your goal number of plants, equals your number of initial plants, that's your plants at time zero, times the probability of a plant survival at time t. So you learn this in that middle school, that's, what, that's what's suggested in the literature. However, we know that attrition is a stochastic process. It's not deterministic and simple like that. Therefore, we approach this problem, we, we decided to approach this problem as a chance constraint, opti with, with chance constraint optimization models. In this case, the number of plants at tiny, time t is, the binomial is a binomial distribution with the following two parameters. That's the number of initial plants, and the probability of the plant survival at time t. So, and that equals your goal, the goal insurance population. So, in fact, we find the current literature underestimates the number of individuals initially needed as the goal is not reached with a given probability. So I'm gonna explain that statement. So right here, we have um, an example where we desire 15 individuals. That's our, our goal target is 15 individuals at a given time. And we know that they, in this case, we have um, a 0.9 survival probability at that given time. Well, how many initial plants do we need? So your number of initial plants is on this x-axis, and the probability of reaching the goal, that's your 15 individuals, is on the y-axis. And the answer from the current literature, that simple math, is represented right here, 16.7, or if you round up to 17 individuals. And you'll see that if you go over here, your probability of reaching the goal is around 0.75. Well, if we're having an insurance population, and we only re are only doing that 75% of the time, that's potentially problematic if, if that's what's, that's the work. So using a, chance constraint optimization model with, say we want to set our, our probability at 0.99, you're gonna, we suggest you need 21 individuals. And, there, and this is a big deal as each individual comes with cost of maintaining and carrying it for it. So that's a pretty simplistic scenario with just one collection at one site with one survival rate. But however, it becomes more complicated when we try to plan for meta collections. And so we decided to use these chance constraints models for meta collections, but realize that there's really two design philosophies behind meta collections. And the case one, we could say, well, we know there's a cost associated with every single individual let's try to minimize the number of individuals we need. And then minimize that across all institutions. While in case two, this really comes from the literature on meta collections, is that we wanted to create a resilient meta collection by splitting the collection between institutions. Now, this what do I mean by resilient? And this really comes from the meta collection literature it's built on this idea that if your population is split among institutions, it will be more resilient to catastrophic events at a particular location, at a particular institution, whether that's a hurricane, as in this example, or an institution loses funding, goes under, and it's just gone. So the idea is that, that having a meta collection split among institutions provides resiliency. So we did some modeling to see to look at these cases. And this is going to be, I'm going to present 
some simple cases with um, a meta collection composed of two institutions. That's collection one down here and collection two here. And in this case, we're going to have a goal of 15 individuals at time t with a stated probability of 0.99. And then we're going to say, all right, well, how many individuals do we need to meet that goal? How many individuals do we need initially to meet that goal? And we're going to set two different survivals, predicted survivals at each of these sites, 0.9 and 0.6. And each, so each one of these little circles represents a unique combination of individuals. So at this particular location, you're going to have zero individuals at collection, um, living collection two, and 21 individuals at living collection one. And in fact, that is actually the minimum number of individuals you need to, to reach this particular goal, because we find that all the area shaded in gray is where the goal is met but there's only this one minimum number of individuals needed to meet that goal. So you're planting all the plants where they survive the best. That's how you're gonna achieve a minimum. Pretty obvious. But let's think about a resilient meta collection. So you have the same type of setup here, but a slightly different goal. And that's goal is 15 individuals at time t, with a stated probability 0.99. But at this case, we want, um, I think it's eight individuals in living collection one and seven individuals in living collection two. And so what combination of individuals do we need to meet that goal? Well, it's right here. Say, um, but it's, you can see, one spot right here. And, um, here, so it's about 20 and 25 individuals. So when you look at these two graphics, you realize some, there's some trade-offs between these two scenarios for a meta collection, these two goals of a meta collection. One, if you minimize the number of individuals, you're gonna end up with needing less individuals, but you're growing all the plants at one collection site. And while a resilient collection is really gonna cost you because different collection location, uh, co sorry, different living collections are going to have, most likely we, th we believe they will have different attrition rates. Especially because, if you go back to the other slide, um, the other work, that it, the, the attrition rate is dependent on collection location and provenance. So those were pretty, I think, some, in, some simple, informative figures to um, simulations to run. But we wanted to think about this work in a more realistic sense. So we have been doing, the horticulture department has been doing a lot of work with Quercus arcansana. Um, horticulturists at the garden have collected um, individuals from across the range of the species. So each one of these colored dots represents a collection location where where this where acorns or other material has been where acorns have been collected actually and grown out. Um, and as part of this project, we did share material with many other gardens throughout the United States. And these gardens include the Morden Arboretum and the Mercer Botanical Garden outside of Houston. And the Morden Arboretum's up outside of Chicago. Now we were we used the the model the the models we developed in the previous study I described and applied them to these collection locations to make first order approximations on sur predicted survival at of of these of this particular species at these collection sites. So that's in this graphic right here. So on the bottom right here is all the regions that they correspond with the same region numbered here. And then on this side is survival probability and for, three series, for the three series of gardens. So up here with the triangles, you have a high, all those different regions or collecting sites had a 
according to our, our predictions, pretty high survival probabilities, which makes sense because this site is pretty much within the range of the species, the known range of the species. And then as you go up in um, latitudes, um, you're going to have um, lower and lower survival. And it does vary site by site. Now, I'm, for the sake of time, I'm not going to present the results from this work, um, specific results from this work, but the patterns remain the exact same, where, as you'd guess, if you're going to want to minimize the size of your collection, you're going to grow all your plants right here in Texas. And if you want to distribute the plants between the gardens, it's going to cost you a lot of individuals. And I think this is really important as we go forward and consider meta collections and insurance populations to consider cost of them and how best to care for plants. I think, um, yeah. So next, I'll talk a little bit about some future directions. We could take this project and some other projects within the horticulture department and the research department. Now, in this slide, we're, we're equal. So the first thing we really would like to do is improve our survival predictions and estimate differences in survival across collections. So as I mentioned to you when I was describing the first research project, we really only used a small number of plantings of the garden. We'd love to expand the work to consider a wider group of plantings where we might not know collection location, but have a lot more survival data. A lot more survival data. And then we are also hoping to work with some other gardens to see if we can make, obtain other their survival data and it, see how survival compares. While climate might be one major factor in predicting ex situ survival, horticultural care really cannot be forgotten about. The different gardens are able to provide different kinds of care and different amenities. We're also hoping to do a common garden experiment. As you know, I just said we collected Quercus arkansana across the range of its species. We're already halfway to a common garden experiment. So we are hoping to do both genetic, um, neutral genetic analysis and um, adaptive phenotypic analysis to determine population differences, if there are, in fact, population differences within this collection. We're also hoping to work on orchid micropropagation for trial reintroductions. And this work is being done in connection with Shaw Nature Reserve and um, I think CCSD. Um, we're also working uh, with Malice and Pyrus Genomics. Um, this is a Malice and Pyrus collected in Kyrgyzstan. Christy Edwards and Emily Warshak are involved in that project, trying to identify the different species and their potential relatedness amongst individuals. So this is my final thought. Um, and I'm taking this from what I heard, the song I heard on the radio again recently that just I find incredibly annoying. But they took all the trees, put them in a tree museum, and they charged the people an arm and a leg to see them. Does this sound at all familiar? Well, I would make the argument that if we're going to do this, something as crazy as this, let's try and make it useful and one way or another. So with that, I'd like to really thank the horticulture staff. We really couldn't have done any of these studies without their diligent plant care and record keeping. And I'd also like to thank all the research staff that commented on this work and made it possible. And with that, I'd like to, to end with a, a kind of a plea to please let us, that's the horticulture department, know if you have an idea for a project or or are simply just interested in accessing our data. And with that, I'll open up to questions.